Michelle mentioned, uh, this is the, the first Sunday of Advent. Uh, Advent uh, literally means coming uh, in its most direct form. And it is a season where we, uh, we remember and celebrate the first coming of Christ, uh, and we look forward to his second coming. Uh, it is a time that, uh, that is intended to be a time of joy and hope, there, though there are the realities of the world uh, around us, right? Uh, and it's a time that's steeped in tradition. Uh, one of the traditions that, that we practice in the church, that we engage in in the church, uh, is the lighting of, of the Advent candles. Um, there's actually a lot of, a lot of symbolism here. Um, and uh, in a couple of minutes, uh, Lucille Kelly is going to come up and share with us, so I'll give you a little forewarning there. But um, in the Advent candles, you see that customarily it's surrounded by a, a wreath and often an evergreen wreath. Uh, the wreath, the, the circle of the wreath being uh, complete uh, and infinite uh, and, and evergreen, uh, meaning always full of life, which is Jesus Christ, right? Uh, the candles, there's meaning behind the candles as well. And this, this tradition, uh, of course, you won't find it anywhere in the Bible. It's tradition, uh, but it has been around for hundreds of years. And customarily, we have uh, three purple candles, one pink candle, and one white candle. Uh, the purple candles, symbolically, uh, purple is the color of Advent, but symbolically represent um, uh, a time of, of inflection, introspection, where we uh, just consider and reflect on who we are in light of, of God, in light of the truth of God and the reality of Jesus Christ. Uh, it represents taking time and, and prayer, uh, sometimes fasting, uh, taking time to, to just step out of the world for a moment anyway. Uh, the pink candle is typically uh, lit on the third Sunday of Advent, and that is the Sunday uh, where we customarily uh, focus on joy. Um, and pink is, uh, is associated with that because um, because it's like a rose, and the Sunday of joy being the one that uh, is an outward expression uh, of our spirituality uh, as well. Uh, and so there's great meaning there. The white candle uh, is the Christ candle, uh, and white representing his, his perfect purity. Uh, and, of course, candles because of uh, Jesus Christ being the light and uh, our life through him for all who uh, acknowledge him as Lord and Savior and choose to follow him, uh, the, the reality that we display his light into the world as well. Uh, so there's great symbolism in the, the practice of the lighting of the Advent candles. Um, we go through each year and, uh, and work on having... Um, uh, a devotional, a reading that goes along with it to, uh, to give us some structure to think and have that time of, of introspection uh, and consider who we are in light of uh, the truth of the first coming of Jesus Christ and the truth and anticipation of his second coming. Uh, so I'm going to say a prayer uh, and then Miss Lucille is going to come up and uh, share with us uh, an Advent reading and, uh, and light an Advent candle for us. Will you pray with me? Heavenly Father, we are so privileged and honored to bow before you this morning, uh, joined together uh, through you and by you uh, in fellowship of, and, uh, and the opportunity to worship who you are. Uh, so, Lord, as we go through this, this first Sunday of Advent, as we think about uh, you sending your Son, Jesus Christ, into the world to show us how to live, to die for our sins, and to have victory over death, that we may live forever in your presence and in relationship with you. We are humbled. And we also praise you and seek to glorify your name. So Father, whether it be through uh, words that are read or expressions that are shared, 
uh, or songs that we sing or a handshake or a hug or a friendly greeting. We trust, Lord, that uh, by the power of your Holy Spirit, uh, that your love and your light will go forth amongst your people this morning, Lord, and uh, will do so in such a way that it shines far beyond the confines of this building uh, and beyond this time. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Advent. Advent is the time of waiting and hoping. We wait for the day when we celebrate the birth of baby Jesus. Just and this was the help. Jesus will then help us know God's love. We light the candle today as a sign of the hope as we wait for the promises to be fulfilled. The Lord Jesus himself and God our Father loved us and through grace gave us eternal comfort and hope. 2 Thessalonians 2.16 Okay, when I think of the events in my life as a child, and actually as an adult as well, I think of the advent calendars that I, I, I was born in 1943, and as long as I can ever remember, we had advent calendars. And they always ended either Christmas Eve or Christmas Day with the uh, birth of Jesus being the scene that would be there. But when I was young, there was an association or a foundation in Chicago, Illinois. It was like the National Epileptic League, I think it was called. But for $5, you could send and donate to the league and get an advent calendar. And my mother sent for those, not only for us, but for everyone she could think of that she could share this with. So, and I continued that as an adult until this became, uh, it wasn't available anymore. So I, I would have no idea how many families that we have shared this tradition with. And hopefully they enjoyed it as much as I did. But they were very different, and I've not been able to find any anywhere that are the same. They were made in Germany, and, uh, but unlike most Advent calendars today, for every window you opened, or every door, or whatever the door happened to be, it had a little clue that went with it. Sometimes it was a one line, sometimes maybe up to four lines, that gave you a clue of what you would be seeing behind that door. And of course, that was always fun. Not only as a child, I found it fun as an adult to anticipate what might be behind that door. But that's just been a very dear thing to me, and um, that would be what I mostly remember as far as if I'm thinking about the things leading up to the Christmas and the birth of Christ. We were each supposed to say something that we remember for Christmas. Um, I was probably 30-some, and I still had to come down the stairway for my grandma to take pictures of us all coming down the stairway. So about 10 years ago, we started making like ornaments for our older relatives and people. And um, sometimes they were just the little foam ones that you get from the dollar store or whatever. But one of the first people we gave them to was this older lady who's our cousin. And to this day, she still tells us every year that she puts it up on her tree. And it just makes me happy that I could do something for somebody and like 10 years later they still appreciate it. I remember when we made bread, banana bread for all of the older people in our family and we made over 50 loaves of bread. And Hunter's not here. He's at a friend's house and um, he probably 
might be embarrassed, but oh well. When he was in fourth grade, he came back to school and the teacher says, what do you like about Christmas or what was your favorite thing? Everybody was telling him about their toys or if they went on a trip. His favorite thing was grandma's chili. One of the things in uh, considering Advent this year that, uh, that I got to thinking about and uh, then later heard through a, uh, a video that a friend of mine shared, a fellow pastor uh, friend shared, is that all across, really, the, the history of humankind, uh, we have been in this season of waiting and in this season of anticipation. At least God's people have been anyway. Uh, we see the, 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 the nation of Israel even before that uh, as, as God had uh, uh, gave Abraham his promise that the nation would be born out of him. Uh, Abram and his wife Sarah had to wait uh, uh, for years and years and years before having a child uh, from whom uh, Abram's uh, uh, promise would be fulfilled or God's promise to Abraham would be fulfilled. Uh, and then as the nation of Israel uh, started to grow and develop and come about and, and then in their bondage and slavery as uh, you know, a million or so people were uh, bound in slavery in Egypt, uh, this waiting, this sense of anticipation for the day that, that they may become free. Uh, and then Moses comes in and, and fulfills uh, the call that God had on his life uh, in leading the people out of the nation of Israel by the power of God. Uh, and the people of Israel, this great nation, uh, were in this, this season, this time of waiting and anticipation uh, of getting to the promised land. And then within the promised land, as, as they lived and their, uh, their spiritual journey ebbed and flowed in and out of obedience uh, to God and relationship with God, uh, and, and prophets came about, there was a sense of, uh, of waiting for when uh, the Messiah would come. And certainly in individual instances, you know, David was, was anointed king as a child, and there was this time of waiting uh, when he didn't know when, when uh, he would truly become king. Uh, and so we see in the Old Testament this, uh, this, this growing swell of anticipation and waiting that came about. And then baby Jesus, born in a manger in the most unassuming way. So much so that the nation of Israel, most of them missed it. They didn't understand. They didn't, they didn't realize the Messiah had come. And many to this day uh, still say, no, the Messiah has not come. Jesus was not the Messiah. But Jesus grew and his ministry began and he, uh, he taught and he healed and he blessed and he uh, convicted and he uh, turned upside down the systems of power uh, in the church, uh, as it were, at that time. And in society. And this waiting came about even for those like his closest followers that, uh, that knew that he probably was the Messiah and had faith in that. Uh, there was still the sense of waiting and anticipation when he would fulfill his role as Messiah and become the king of Israel that would fulfill God's promise and, 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 and make Israel fully uh, in, in power and uh, this, this force above all in the world. And then they saw Jesus hanging on the cross. They didn't understand. And then the tomb is empty. Hallelujah, what just happened, right? 
and the risen Jesus begins to meet with them and continues to teach them. And the risen Jesus then says uh, that, uh, that he was going to go home, and we're going to read about that in John chapter 14 in just a couple of moments. Uh, but that he was going to go home. But I'll be back. I'll return for you. And here we are some 2,000 years later. In this season of waiting and anticipation for when Jesus returns again. And I don't know if it has to do with the fact that I'm getting older or if it has to do with the realities of the world. It's probably some combination of both. But each day and each major news headline, I think, oh my goodness, he has to be coming soon. That sense of anticipation continues to build. That looking forward to uh, his coming, his second coming, grows. And yet I fear that, much like the nation of Israel, most of them missed out on his first arrival here that many of us in the church might miss out on his second arrival because we don't know, we don't understand. We aren't prepared. We don't see. And so let me read, uh, read with you this morning, John chapter 14, verses 1 through 14. Um, and then we're going to jump in this, I think, a little bit of a unique way. Uh, but John recorded these words from Jesus. Let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, would I have told you I go to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and will take you to myself that where I am, you may be also. And you know the way to where I'm going. Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you are going. How can we know the way? And Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you, would have known, if you had known me, you would have known my Father also. From now on you do know him and have seen him. Philip said to him, Lord, show us the Father, and it is enough for us. And Jesus said to him, Have I been with you so long and you still do not know me, Philip? Whoever has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Do you not believe that I am in the Father and the Father is in me? The words I say to you, I do not speak on my own authority, but the Father who dwells in me does his works. Believe me that I am the Father and the Father is in me, or else believe on the account of the works themselves. Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever believes in me will also do the works that I do, and greater works than these will he do, because I am going to the Father. Whatever you ask in my name, this I will do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask me anything in my name, I will do it. And so Jesus is sharing with, with his disciples that I'm going to go, and I'm going to go and prepare a place for you. I'm going to return. I'm going to come get you and take you to that place. And this is something that uh, in our culture we don't fully understand. I mean, it sounds like a great promise, and it's one that we, uh, one that we celebrate, and it's one that we draw upon uh, in times when we, when we need comfort as well. But what his disciples knew, what his followers in that time knew, 
is that Jesus was speaking of, as had often been recorded in Scripture, even up to the life of Jesus. Jesus was speaking of the reality that, uh, that, that Jesus is the groom and his people are the bride, and he was describing the sequence of events of a Jewish wedding in that time. And doing so in part to, uh, uh, in part to instruct us and inform us on the nature of our relationship with him, but also in part to communicate to uh, the people at that time anyway, in a way that they would clearly understand. And so if we go back and look at what a, uh, what a Jewish wedding in biblical times looked like, there are some key milestones that, for those of you who uh, uh, have been around church or been around God's Word for very long, may think sound a little bit familiar in light of our Christian journey. And so... Boy and girl, right? And uh, sometimes, it depends on the time, uh, marriages were prearranged, but we have boy and girl, and they come of age, and there comes a commitment to get married, a betrothal, uh, as it was called. And in that time of betrothal, which typically lasted about a year, uh, there would be a, a ceremony of sorts, and uh, part of that ceremony was that the, uh, that the groom would pay a price for the bride. And so if we think about that, if Jesus is the groom and the church is the bride, did Jesus pay a price for his bride? Has that happened? Jesus paid the ultimate price for his bride, right? By the very giving of his life. And in that time of betrothal, there is a commitment. And that commitment uh, was something to uh, not be taken casually. I mean, that was the commitment that we consider the marriage vows today. That was the covenant commitment in its time. And the word covenant is a term that's familiar to us within Christianity as well. well. We know of the old covenant, you know, God's promise to his people and the giving of the, uh, the law, right? Um, and then the new covenant, God's promise to his people through the redemptive work of his son, Jesus Christ, on the cross and his victory over death and sin. And so... The bride, we as the church, as we commit to Jesus, as we commit our life to him and surrender to him, we are accepting our end, our portion of the covenant, and we are betrothed to Jesus. That betrothal has happened. And then in the Jewish tradition, uh, upon the betrothal, there would be a ceremonial bath that would take place, a mikvah. Uh, people of Jewish faith still partake in that today, a mikvah, and that is part of a traditional Jewish wedding today as well. And a mikvah is a, is a purifying bath. Go into the water, and as we come out, we are purified. Does that sound familiar to anyone? It should. That's baptism, right? Right? Our groom, Jesus Christ, was baptized. Church, as a profession of our faith and uh, a part of our commitment in following Jesus Christ, we do as he did, and so we too are baptized. As we go in the baptismal waters, death to the old self, and we are risen anew, a new creation. Pure and holy. Also at the time of the betrothal, there would be 
I should have made a note of it, I forget the exact, exact term, in our language today, a toast. A drink shared in celebration of the relationship that is being formed and what is to come. And we do that from time to time in the church. As we come to the Lord's table and partake in communion. And also at the time of betrothal. The groom would typically give his bride a gift. A promise. A gift that would assure the bride that he would return for her. And likewise, Jesus gave us a gift as well. Right after uh, this portion of John that I read, even, and in other passages, Jesus said, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. So if you love me, and you're betrothed to me, you will uh, be united with me and, and keep with me. Now I'll ask the Father, and he will give you another helper to be with you forever. The Spirit of truth, the Holy Spirit, whom the world cannot receive, because it neither sees him nor knows him. You know him, for he dwells with you and will be in you. And so upon our betrothal to Jesus, upon that, that, that full commitment to him, we receive the gift of the Holy Spirit that assures us that he will return, that he will come again for us. And so as is customary to a Jewish wedding at that time, the groom would leave his betrothed, his bride, and go to his father's house. And at his father's house, he would prepare a place for the new family, for his new family. Prepare a room or rooms or uh, build a separate dwelling for them at or near his father's house to make that ready for his bride. And that's what Jesus is doing right now. He has gone to his father's house to prepare a place for us, for the church, for his bride. For when he returns, he will take us to be there with him. Now, while he was gone, certainly the bride was not free to live however she wanted. Uh, but the bride is to honor the commitment and the covenant of marriage uh, and the bride's responsibility during that time that her groom was off making the house was to prepare wedding garments of the finest linen representing purity to keep herself pure for sure as well. To prepare the things that would make that house a home. And so, church, as we are his bride and our groom is off, making a place for us, that remains our responsibility as his bride. To weave into our lives purity, the things that keep us pure the things that uh, uh, allow us to focus on and think of him and life in his presence forevermore. To not dishonor him by being unfaithful. To keep him in, in his proper place as the head of our house. and to prepare for a life with him forevermore. 
That remains our charge today for all who are betrothed to Jesus, all who have uh, surrendered to him, all who have entered into this commitment to live with him forevermore. All who have taken up this new covenant, all who have, uh, all who um, take part in the Lord's table. That remains our commitment to him. That we may continually do the things that keep us pure and set aside the things that do not. That we would do the things that uh, show those around us that we are committed to our groom and look forward to eternity with him. And when we feel alone in that, when we are struggling with the realities of this world blowing up around us and taking away that sense of anticipation and the, the, the hope that we have in his promise of his return, that we rely on that gift that he gave us, that gift of his Holy Spirit dwelling within us, that wherever we are, We know he loves us, he's committed to us, and he can't wait to come get his bride. And so Jesus is doing his part as, as the groom and off at his father's house and preparing a place. And uh, as was the case in the, 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 the biblical times of a Jewish wedding, the groom's father would decide when it was time for the groom to go retrieve his bride. The groom did not know the time or the hour, just like Jesus says that he does not know the time or the hour, but only the Father does. The bride did not know as well. But they did know that it was customarily about a year. And there were certain signs that would come along with it. And ultimately, as the groom came into town to retrieve his bride, he would send someone ahead to announce, the groom is coming and blow the shofar or the trumpet. And for those of you who know a little bit about end time prophecy and, and John's revelation inspired by the Holy Spirit, we know that when Christ returns, the trumpet will sound, right? Announcing that the groom is coming, the groom is coming. A Pastor Phil shared a couple weeks ago from Matthew chapter 25, uh, the first portion of that chapter where Jesus is teaching, the kingdom of heaven will be like, and I love when Jesus paints these pictures of heaven, but the kingdom of heaven will be like ten virgins who took their lamps and went to meet their bridegroom. So uh, uh, brides would keep a lamp lit so that the groom would know where to come to retrieve them, where their house was at night. And so Jesus is saying the kingdom of heaven is like uh, ten virgins who took their lamps and went to meet the bridegroom. Five were foolish and five were wise. When the foolish one took, th took their lamps, they took no oil with them, but the wise took flasks of oil with their lamps. As the bridegroom was delayed, they all became drowsy and slept. But at midnight there was a cry, Here is the bridegroom, come out to meet him. Then they all rose and trimmed their lamps. And the foolish said, give us some of your oil, our lamps are going out. And the wise said, there won't be enough for us and you, so go buy it for yourselves. And while they were going to get more oil, the bridegroom came. And those who were ready went to the marriage feast. And the door was shut. 
Afterward, the other virgins came saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. But he said, truly, I say to you, I do not know you. Watch, therefore, for you know neither the day nor the hour. So Jesus is, is, is using this likeness and this reality of him as the groom and his people as the bride and saying, bride, be ready. Don't grow complacent. Jesus is saying, have hope in me because I am faithful and what I tell you is true. But don't grow complacent because of what you see in the world. Don't grow complacent because you think I'm running late. Don't neglect your preparations. Because when the time and the hour come, if the bride is not ready, she hasn't upheld her betrothal and will not go with the groom. And so as we reflect on Jesus' first coming, and as we have this sense of anticipation building within us for his return, It is so important, church, that we aren't complacent, that we don't simply uh, take for granted this gift of salvation that Jesus offers us and uh, the relationship that we have with him because of him, that we don't take it for granted and neglect our end of the agreement, that we don't honor our responsibilities under the new covenant and the betrothal. Don't live like the world and be found out of oil when he returns. Don't fail to do your part in keeping yourself pure and be found lacking when he returns. The hope that we have in Christ is a great thing and as much as we are faithful to him. Because the truth of Jesus Christ is that he is just. We don't want to be found lacking. I'd like to pray with you this morning as we close, and I'd like to pray that during this time of Advent, we are able to uh, sense with great anticipation his return. That we are able to find and take time to truly focus on where we need to work, the things we need to do, how we need to allow the Holy Spirit to move that we may be purified, that our lamps may be filled with oil, that we would be a faithful bride. Will you pray with me? Father, we thank you today so much for, uh, for your, your truth and your reality, and we thank you so much for uh, the preservation of your word and your scripture, uh, as well as uh, the historical lessons and knowledge that we have that help us to, uh, to more completely understand the things that, uh, that don't exactly uh, match right up with our culture today. Lord, we thank you this morning that, uh, that you did send your son as our savior and as our groom. And Lord, I pray that uh, for each of us here, that in the days ahead, as we uh, think of you, as we focus on you and your truth through this Advent season, that there would be a building sense of anticipation and appreciation. And that by the moving of your Holy Spirit, that we would find and claim 
the purification that you have provided for us, that we would become a faithful bride. So that when we think of Jesus' return, when you send him here to claim his bride, that we wouldn't think of it as hope with a question mark, but that we would claim it as hope with an exclamation point. And in so doing, Lord, that those around us would be influenced as well by your love and by your truth. For there's nothing more important than you and your salvation. And there's no more precious a gift. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.